surface water, and uh, Mark Ferry will be our presenter. Uh, Mark is an environmental scientist at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, where he has worked for 20 years. Before coming to the MPCA, he studied the microbial degradation of pesticides in soil at the University of Minnesota. Since then, he has focused on monitoring and understanding the fate of contaminants in the environment. He is currently studying pharmaceuticals and endocrine active compounds in Minnesota's surface water. Mark has BS and MS degrees in microbiology and environmental science, both from the University of Minnesota. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks, everybody, for coming to, uh, to this session's talk. Um, I thought what I would do is start off this talk with a story. And it's a good story. A couple of years ago, I was taking samples at different locations around the state, uh, particularly at wastewater treatment plants, above and below wastewater treatment plants, to see what we have in our water in terms of these pharmaceuticals and endocrine active chemicals. And I had the chance uh, to spend a very pleasant day on the Grindstone River, which maybe some of you know is uh, runs through Hinckley, Minnesota. And this photograph was taken that day uh, just downstream of the wastewater treatment plant in, in Hinckley. And it was a beautiful day. As you can see, a wonderful place. I'd be happy to bring my family there for a picnic on the banks of the river. And I really hated to leave that spot because it was such a pleasant day and such a pleasant location. As chance would have it, about a half an hour later, I was going upstream to take my, my water sample upstream of the wastewater treatment plant there. And I happened to run into, just by chance, the, uh, the operator of the wastewater treatment plant system there. His name is Jerry. And uh, he had been operating the wastewater treatment plant system there for over 35 years. And so I got, got to talking to him, and we had this great con conversation for a while. And uh, he told me, just uh, in passing, that he grew up on the Grindstone River, not far from where I took this photograph, in the 40s, the late 30s and 40s. He's an older fellow. And he said, you know, i got to tell you, when I grew up down there on the farmhouse down there, he said a nice warm summer evening, he said, you couldn't stand to be by that river. And it really occurred to me then, and I like to start off this talk uh, with, with that anecdote, of really how far we have come as a state and, and as a country in protecting and, and our, our water and treating our wastewater in ways that, that I can't even recall. Because at that time, there, were no wastewater, there wasn't a wastewater treatment plant on this river. It was basically raw sewage from the city going into the river. And it was terrible. And a lot of older people, like my dad, would tell me that too. You didn't want to be by the rivers. They were sewers. We've come a long way in environmental protection in this country. And uh, we, need to, we need to keep that in mind. Having said that, where, where I take off on this a little bit is that um, our wastewater treatment plants, uh, as well designed as they were in the 60s when, when they were, most of them, 60s and 70s when they were put in, uh, were not designed to remove everything from the waste stream. And that's something that I think is news to a lot of people. And in 1994, um, a researcher by the name of Christopher Purdom in the UK did some research on the effluent from our waste wastewater treatment plants and found out that chemicals that were coming out of our wastewater treatment plants were actually changing <coughs> the, the sexual uh, biochemistry and morphology of rainbow trout that he exposed these uh, exposed fish to the wastewater effluent 
and found that it changed them. And since then, we have started looking more in depth, really worldwide, uh, but particularly here in Minnesota, we have a lot to be proud of in this respect, uh, in looking at, okay, what is coming out of our wastewater treatment plants that we should be concerned about that we haven't either known about or been concerned about before. And in this respect, the USGS has really taken a big lead in getting us to the point of knowing what's in this wastewater effluent. In 2000, the uh, USGS did a national reconnaissance study, really a hallmark study of what is in our water primarily associated with wastewater treatment plant effluent around the country. And that got our attention enough so that, at least here in Minnesota, we started focusing a great deal on what kind of chemicals, what kind of medications, what kind of chemicals that behave like hormones are coming out of our wastewater treatment plants. And in 2002, uh, Kathy Lee here in US, uh, the USGS office uh, did a similar study to the 2000 national study characterizing these chemicals coming out of our wastewater treatment plants. And uh, that was followed up by a, a couple of other studies, a Mississippi, Ri Mississippi River longitudinal study, kind of a fancy way of saying, well, sampled the, the, the water from Bemidji all the way down to the Iowa border. And after, after the Iowa border, of course, we don't care, right? Uh, <laughs> but took a lot of samples to see what was in our, in our water there. And then a more focused study looking at three tributaries. The Grindstone River that I just talked about, the Redwood River, and the Crow Rivers uh, south of here. And all of those tended to show and confirm that what we see out of our wastewater treatment plants, we see coming out of our wastewater treatment plants, uh, carries with it a number of chemicals that really reflect our lifestyle and, and what we do in, in our society. <coughs> Largely because of the great funding that the state of Minnesota voted to give uh, us in 2008, that three-eighths of a cent tax that uh, people voted as a constitutional amendment to look at environmental issues and protect our environment, we were able to use a little bit of that money to look at 25 wastewater treatment plants around the state and really characterize, give us a very clear idea of what was uh, coming out of our wastewater treatment plants in Minnesota. And so what we did in conjunction with the USGS was to sample surface water and sediment above and below each of these 25 different wastewater treatment plants spread across uh, the state and also take samples of the effluent that was coming out of these wastewater treatment plants as well. And each of these samples were analyzed for something like 100 and some, 120 what we call organic wastewater chemicals or, or chemicals that I was talking about before, these pharmaceuticals and endocrine active chemicals. And we also were able to look at how fish that were exposed to this effluent in the, in the rivers might be being changed or might be being affected by the chemicals that were uh, exposed uh, to those chemicals. So here's a synopsis of what was found in that study. I'm not going to go through each of these chemicals in detail. But you can see the type is, typeset is a bit small on this slide, I, I apologize, but we found a lot of different medications, a lot of different pharmaceuticals associated with the wastewater that comes out of our wastewater treatment plants. Amongst those are things like caffeine. Well, that's not a terribly big surprise. We also find things like antidepressants, fluoxetin, which is basi basically the same thing, it's Prozac. Uh, eupropion is another one of those similar antidepressants. And a lot of different uh, chemicals, uh, the, the medication used to treat ADHD, carbamazepine, 
found in um, basically just about every single uh, wastewater treatment plant effluent that we looked at. Triclosan, it, this was a list of pharmaceuticals, and not so we didn't. I don't have triclosan included in that, um, but we found that in about, ten, I believe, about ten to fifteen percent of our samples. The black bars in this bar chart are what we find coming out of the effluent of our wastewater treatment plants, and the gray bars underneath are what we find downstream. And so it's not a big surprise that what we see coming out of the effluent of our wastewater treatment plants, we typically see downstream as well. The antibiotic sulfa, the sulfa drugs we find coming out of our effluent and downstream. Uh, these an antidepressants, venlafaxin, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, bupropion, we find effluent and downstream. What was a surprise to us was that we also were finding a number of these chemicals, like the metabolite of nicotine, or uh, the antibiotic trimethoprim, or sulfamethoxazole. You can see as well as I can point them out. We we're also seeing them upstream of the wastewater treatment plants as well. And we didn't really anticipate that. Yes? When you say upstream and downstream, how far? Where are we to bracket that discharge? The question was, how far upstream or downstream were we sampling? Typically, the downstream sampling points were within a quarter mile of, of the outfall of the outfall of the uh, wastewater treatment plant, and the upstream samples were about the same distance upstream, too. It kind of depended on the location and the access point, but we're not talking a great deal downstream in this study. We're not talking about a great deal uh, of distance upstream. They were in the proximity. What were the difference in concentration? I'm going to get to the concentrations in a little bit, and if you have questions on that, I'd be happy to get into that a little bit later. But what was interesting to us was that we were finding these concentrations upstream as well as downstream fairly consistently. In some cases, the concentrations upstream tended to be higher than the concentrations downstream, which was a big surprise to us as well. So we followed that up <coughs> with another study saying, well, if we're finding these chemicals upstream, of what we had previously thought were the biggest sources of these chemicals to our environment, what would we find if we looked at ambient water statewide that didn't have clear sources of these chemicals to our water? So we got the funding to look at 50 randomly selected lakes across the state of Minnesota for these same chemicals that we had looked at wastewater treatment plants previously. And we looked for 125 different pharmaceuticals, hormone-like chemicals that I'm going to show you uh, in the next few slides. But primarily amongst those, we looked at alkyl phenols. <coughs> alkyl phenols are the breakdown products of a class of detergents that are very widespread, that are used commercially, typically, industrially, <coughs> used as surfactants to spread pesticides on crops, for example. It's the breakdown product. These alkyl phenols are the breakdown product of those detergents, and they tend to be estrogenic. In other words, they tend to act like weak hormones. So that is one of the things that we've been looking for over the past 10 years in these studies. We also looked at the presence of hormones in the water, a variety of medications, pharmaceuticals, triclosan and triclocarban, which are uh, topical uh, disinfectants, and bisphenol A. You've probably heard of BPA. I've been in the news a lot. Uh, BPA is used in, in to form plastic, polycarbonate, and it, behaves like a very weak hormone. In fact, in the 30s, uh, researchers are looking at bisphenol A as an estrogen replacement because it has an estrogenic property to it. It wasn't very effective. It was never used that way. But somebody else figured out, hey, this stuff makes great plastic. And so now we make 
polycarbonate out of it. Uh, but uh, bisphenol A is one of the things that we're concerned about because it behaves like a weak hormone. And these lakes, you can see, were spread from the very northern part of the state down the southern part of the state, all randomly selected um, for inclusion in the study. So what did we find? Well, we found a number of different hormones in the water, um, all at very, very low parts per trillion. Uh, all of these, with the exception of um, allyl trenbolone, which is used as a feed stock additive, uh, uh, basically to treat cattle, to put on growth, and mestrinol, which is a contraceptive hormone. All of these are naturally occurring, but they're all associated typically with wastewater. And so you can see here the androstenedione, or andro, we found in about 30% of the lakes that we looked in, uh, and others in lower, uh, cons a lower number of detections across the state, um, anywhere from 5 to 10% of the time, testosterone, uh, estrone, which is another estrogen, um, and, and a few others that we find in ambient lake water across the state. The alkyl phenols that I was talking about earlier, uh, nonyl phenols, they're a class of these alkyl phenols, so we group them together. 10% of the lakes that we looked at have alkyl phenols, uh, the nonyl phenols in them, with uh, four, um, about 4 or 5% uh, containing octyl phenol. Both these are alkyl phenol compounds that behave like these weak hormones, weak estrogens. DEET, we find virtually everywhere in all of our surface water. In this particular study, we found DEET in 76% of the uh, lakes that we looked at. Um, in previous studies, we found it in 100% of the lakes that we've, we've looked at. It's a very, very common contaminant uh, and definitely not naturally occurring, so we know it's all anthropogenic. And then triclosan, typically uh, we have found that in anywhere from 5 to 15% of the samples that we'll look at. This is no exception. We found triclosan, the uh, disinfectant, in uh, I believe it was 5 or 6% of the lakes that we looked at across the state. So DEET is strictly from mosquito repellent? DEET is, as far as I know, and I've looked, uh, I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. DEET is not naturally occurring. No, it is strictly from uh, the uh, Insect repellent it's use. The only place it's, used. it's basically the only place it's used, correct. When we get into the pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I'm <coughs> put everything up there that I can. Very interestingly, this was the first time we had looked at two compounds, carbidox and amitriptyline. Carbidox is an antibiotic that is only used in the rearing of swine. Has no other approved purpose. And yet, in our study of 50 randomly selected lakes around the state, we found carbidox in 28% of the lakes that we looked at. All of these, again, are in parts per trillion. Amitriptyline, which is a very commonly prescribed antidepressant, we found that also in 28% of the lakes that we looked at. Caffeine, well, that's not too much of a surprise given how much caffeine that we consume and excrete every day. We found that in over 15% of the samples that we looked at. And then others, sulfa drugs, this antidepressant, fluoxetine, Prozac, um, other sulfa drugs, other antibiotics down here, uh, the cholesterol, lowering drug, gemfibrozil, and carbamazepine that I talked about, the ADHD drug, um, also found that in a lower number, of, uh, lower number of detections as well. But all of these we found in lakes that 
really had no clear source of these contaminants to surface water other than um, septic systems, possibly, around the lakes. Um, and I'll give a little bit of a plug. Uh, Richard Kiesling is, is here. He's going to be talking about that a little bit later and what he is find, finding in terms of the uh, impact of uh, septic systems around homes on lakes uh, that might be a contribution of these chemicals to our surface water as well. Really interesting thing in this study <laughs> was that we found cocaine in 32% of the lakes that we studied statewide. And the, we knew this is a real result because the breakdown product, benzoyleconine or BE, we also found 28% of the lakes. So we're confident that the chemical cocaine was present in these lakes and it wasn't something that was similar to it that we might have mistaken for analytically. 32% of the lakes contained that chemical and, and the reason we think it might be getting there is other studies in Europe have shown that cocaine is very commonly detected in atmospheric samples above cities. So we think that cocaine is probably getting into our air from different cities, different uses around, you know, different uses <laughs> around the around the country, around the state, for example, getting in the air and probably entering our lakes through uh, rainfall and atmospheric deposition. But we can detect it. In 2000, uh, well, it, if you think about the use of cocaine, whether it's smoked or in its powder form, it's introduced to the air. And it becomes airborne very easily, and it disperses very easily. Uh, researchers in Italy have been able to detect how much cocaine is used on a given day just based on the number of, uh, uh, the amount of cocaine that they can measure in the atmosphere uh, on a daily basis. So it's very sensitive, but we're, we're, uh, we can detect it. Yes? These 50 random lakes, I'm just curious, um, are they all like, recreational lakes, or are, are they all, I'm wondering uh, as far as access. Right. So they're all developed, or are some of them totally remote with no, no so the question is, when we're talking about this random selection of lakes, do they all tend to be recreational? Are they all urban? Or are they all very remote? Do we have a mix, more or less? The answer to that is because they're randomly selected, a few, a number of them are very remote. Okay, um, A few are urban. A number of them have lakeshore development that might reflect uh, housing and septic system influence. But it's a very wide sampling of the kind of lakes that we might see in the state. We only found three lakes in the state, very m remote lakes, that didn't have any of these contaminants. Many of them had one, two, or three. The highest number of contaminants we found uh, had nine. That lake actually did have a wastewater treatment plant that was operating on uh, to treat treat sewage from a nearby town. Yes? Has, have you ever tested a human body to find out how many of these things are in the body? It sounds like we might not have to go to the doctor ever again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. So the, uh, the question is, have I tested the human body <laughs> for how many of these chemicals we might find uh, in the average person? And I can tell you, the answer to that is no, I have not. Um, but it's a good segue into what I'm going to get into a little bit later in the talk, and uh, hopefully it'll answer some of what you're going to Let me just say ask. this. We're going to be showing the Baggett movie next. And in the movie, Peter Coyote, the actor, is tested to see how many chemicals he and it's pages and pages and pages of chemicals, and I'm sure probably all of those, along with chemicals that come directly from plastic. So the, the comment is, there are other studies <laughs> that have been done to show how many chemicals have that we all carry mm -hmm. in, in us. Not only pharmaceuticals, but 
anthropogenic chemicals that we may not even know are in us. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit in a few slides. And I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be interesting to people to, to see what is known, at least in a little bit there. Hey, Mark, I have one, quick, one more quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it matter if the sewage treatment plant is tertiary? Do any of these things come out in tertiary treatment? Or that's a that's a good question. The, the the question is that based on the kind of treatment that wastewater treatment plants have, because we have a variety, we have 500 different wastewater treatment plants around the state, and they all vary in terms of how they treat the sewage that they get. A lot of it depends on the size of the municipality that they're they're serving. A lot of it depends on the volume of the sewage that they have to treat. Some of them only discharge to surface water once or twice a year. It's intermittent discharge. Some of them, like the metro plant in the Twin Cities, it's 250 million gallons a day of sewage that is treated and enters the river every day. So there's a big variety of treatment and size and capacity of these plants. Typically, uh, I have not seen yet a big difference in what is comes out of the effluent of a treatment plant, depending on what kind of treatment there is. I think there is a component there, but I don't know enough about it. I think some of the, it depends on the chemical, but kind of a rule of thumb is that a lot of these probably are removed at a rate of about 50% out of the treatment plant system. 50% might be expected to flow through. This was a study, a follow-on study, that we just released in a report uh, a few months ago, a lake study of, of 11 lakes, a follow-on study of a, a study that we'd done in 2008, um, confirming the types of chemicals that we see most and the kind of frequency and concentrations that we see. So in this study, um, just going over maybe the top five or six chemicals in terms of detection frequency. DEET is still king. We see that in over 90% of the lake samples that we take. Uh, the, the degradation product of nicotine, cotinine, we find, again, very frequently, 70-some percent. Uh, Iopamidol, was, this is the first study that we had included Iopamidol and metformin. Iopamidol is an x-ray contrasting agent. It's given to you if you have an x-ray and the doctor wants to make, uh, wants to see a high contrast resolution of that x-ray. So you'll get a shot of iopamidol. It contrasts the tissues real well in terms of an x-ray. We found that compound in 72% of the lakes that we looked at in that study. Metformin uh, is a drug given to type 2 diabetic patients to control blood sugar levels. We found metformin in 36% of the lake samples that we looked at. And bisphenol A, that chemical that acts like a weak hormone, now used to make polycarbonate, we found in 36% of the lakes as well. And uh, other antibiotics and cholesterol-lowering drugs and uh, Triclosan down here we found at almost 10% of the samples. So we see a pretty consistent message, a pretty consistent signature of chemicals and pharmaceuticals and medications no matter where we look and no matter when we look. It's pretty consistent signal across our surface water, across the state, regardless of where we look and so I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of how widespread and how ubiquitous these things are. This is Elk Lake, which is an Itasca State Park. It has no lakeshore development. It has one group camp over the ridge, over this ridge, maybe a quarter mile, I'm thinking. It does get bordered by a road, but that's it. And in that lake, we find DEET. We find the nicotine breakdown product, cotinine. We find the diabetic drug, metformin, uh, anti-inflammatory drug, colchicine, and bisphenol A. Uh, 
in Elk Lake. I can tell you, I have had to become a virtual pharmacist <laughs> in understanding what each of these chemicals are, not only that, but how to pronounce them as well. Um, Northern Light Lake, how many, guys, how many people know where Northern Light Lake might be? One, two, Richard knows. Uh, Northern Light Lake is uh, north of Grand Marais, Minnesota on the North Shore, and this is the Gunflint Trail running past Northern Light Lake. Uh, it's a rather isolated lake. Uh, it doesn't have much access. It has no motorized access to speak of. There are no homes on the lake, uh, but it is on the Brule River. And in that lake, we found deep BPA, bisphenol A, diltiazem, which is a blood pressure medication, uh, and a number of antibiotics, uh, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, trimethoprim, clinophloxacin. Each of these are antibiotics that are probably coming from upstream. The Brule River goes up to Poplar Lake, which is about 25 to 30 miles upstream uh, where there are cabins on, on that lake and corresponding septic systems. So what we see here is probably a signature of the upstream influence uh, of, lake, of a lake 30 miles away. But this is a very remote lake. If you were to go out there, you would never believe it. Where are these things coming from? Wastewater treatment plants, we've already talked about that, are a, a big obvious source of, of these chemicals to our surface water. Septic systems, basically the way a septic system works is what you put down the drain. I have a septic system at home, many people do, goes to a tank and then that overflows to a drain field. Any water and anything that water carries with it is going to flow down to groundwater which moves to the nearby lake or river. Storm water is another big contributor of chemicals like this to our surface water. Maybe not so much pharmaceuticals, but things associated with runoff. These alkyl phenol compounds that I was talking about, uh, bisphenol A, poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbons that we didn't measure in this, but are highly associated with storm water and probably pesticides. And I touched a little bit on atmospheric transport um, of these things. We're going to be taking some rainwater samples this summer and air samples to see if we can find these chemicals associated with our atmosphere, maybe accounting for how some of these things like BPA and DEET are reaching our, our uh, surface water. It's already been demonstrated for things like pesticides and cocaine that I mentioned earlier. And uh, we hope to be able to show that, well, at least some of this might be explained by atmospheric deposition. Hospitals and clinics are probably another source of these pharmaceuticals to our environment because a lot of this stuff, let's face it, goes down the drain, whether it's through excretion or through flushing of these chemicals down toilets or down drains. They dispose of a wide variety of pharmaceuticals, x-ray contrasting agents, this iopamidol, antidepressants and unused medications, and agricultural sources, row crops. These alkyl phenol ethoxylates uh, and have surfactants associated with them to spread these chemicals out on leaves. That stuff runs off and probably in our surface water. <coughs> can be looking at antibiotics in livestock that are only used in livestock. I've listed a few of them here. Uh, Carbidox is one of those that we see very commonly. And we also see the sulfa drugs and sometimes tylosin and Virginia mycin as well. Runoff from feedlots and fields goes into surface water. It gets associated with the particles that run off from feedlots and, and from, from farm fields and gets into water. And aquaculture can be another big source of these chemicals, these antibiotics to our surface water because fish populations have to be treated very heavily with antibiotics to keep them healthy in that kind of environment. So these antibiotics are added directly to the surface water 
where these fish are being raised in order to keep them healthy and in their food. So a lot of times we'll see uh, some of these antibiotics associated with surface water as well, although not so much the tetracyclines. So very quickly, a part per trillion. You know, a lot of times I get asked, a part per trillion, we find a lot of these things that say 5 to 10 parts per trillion. Are you kidding me? A part per trillion? That is vanishingly small. A part per trillion is really the same thing as one drop in 20 swimming pools. Can that possibly have an effect on anything? So I did a little bit of off-the-cuff research to say, well, what other chemicals are we exposed to that we know have effect? What kind of concentrations might those be at? And <coughs> kind of skipping down to some of the ones down here, which are at the lowest concentrations. If we look at uh, ethanyl estradiol, which is the synthetic contraceptive used by many people, and people rely on that a lot, that comes out to be, if you take a 20 microgram dose of that, 250 parts per trillion effective dose in your body, that's a very simplified way of looking at it. It's very effective. The king of them all, I found, is botulism toxin, where if you take a 50 nanogram dose, it's less than a part per trillion in your body. It kills you half the time. The other half of the time, you'd probably wish it had. So some of these chemicals can be very effective at these kind of concentrations. And when we look at these kind of chemicals, these antibiotics, antidepressants, antibacterials, we're talking about biochemically active chemicals. They were designed to be bioactive. And so we shouldn't be too terribly surprised to find out that these chemicals can be very, have very notable effect at very, very low concentration. Then we have endocrine active chemicals, things that are hormones, like the estrogens, testosterone, the contraceptive medications, or insulin, for example. Those are all hormones. Or man-made chemicals that act like hormones. Bisphenol A I talked about. The detergents, these alkyl phenols that I talked about, break down products from detergents. Many pesticides and PBDE all act like hormones. They can act at levels that are below a part per trillion. Now, to get into a little bit of why we should care about this, PBDE is a flame retardant used in just about everything, from computer consoles to drapery to all sorts of fabrics. Added to everything is a fire retardant. People looking into this and researching it have found that PBDE, these very common fire retardants decrease fertility in women exposed to PBDE. And bisphenol A affects the way glucose is used in animals. These researchers concluded that BPA might be very easily one of the factors that affects diabetes and obesity in people. And I said before, it is found in polycarbonate all around us, bisphenol A is. The really interesting thing is that, to get at your earlier comment and question, bisphenol A is found in 92% of us, all of us, all the time. We're always exposed to it, even though it breaks down very quickly. It's found in our, our blood and urine all the time. And that 97% of us have PBDE in our blood right now. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, has PBDE in us. We're exposed to this stuff a lot. Yes? Do you know if PBDE is bioaccumulative? I don't know if PBDE is bioaccumulative. I'm not a toxicologist. I'm not sure about that. <coughs> One of the most inter interesting studies that I came across is that, and I've got to finish up, but one of the more interesting studies I found in the past few years is a very carefully conducted study where they fed mice bisphenol A, BPA. Mothers uh, of pups were given BPA in their chow for a number of days, and then it was removed completely from the food. 
And so they traced subsequent generations to see what would happen. So none of the subsequent generations had any BPA added to their food at all. And yet, through four generations, what they found was that they could trace, they could independently observe behavioral changes in the F4 generation of mice just because of the exposure of that great grandparent to bisphenol A in her diet at that time. So that led these researchers to conclude that bisphenol A produces transgenerational alterations in genes. In other words, it's affecting this contaminant, in mice anyway, was affecting the way DNA, our genetic material, behaves over generations of organism. Environmental effects. Dosing an experimental lake with five parts per trillion of ethanyl estradiol, the contraceptive medication, caused minnow population to collapse within two years. Very dramatic collapse in the fish population. 30 parts per trillion of fluvoxamin, another antidepressant, triggers immediate spawning in freshwater mussels. So you can see that environmentally or in laboratory controlled experiments, these chemicals can have dramatic effect at part per trillion level concentrations. All right. I am going to go to one of the examples of an environmental effect that I think is probably the most disturbing. And if this doesn't get your attention, I don't know what would. Diclofenac is a pain-killing medication that, was that we commonly take in our country all the time, used worldwide. It was introduced into India for the treatment of their livestock in the 90s. Why would they do that? Well, they, they rely a lot on their livestock as beasts of burden. And so they try to relieve pain so they get more work out of their animals. So they, treat their, they were treating their animals with diclofenac to get more work out of them. The thing is, it was lethal to the vultures on the Indian subcontinent to the point where they have lost all of their vultures, all of these vultures, over a 20-year period. They're basically gone. And people looking into this look to see that one of maybe 760 carcasses that vultures would prey on or clean up was enough to kill them at part per million or part per billion level concentrations. Microbiologically, some studies show that antibiotics can be adding to microbial, bacterial resistance to these antibiotics environmentally, which we should be concerned about because we rely on antibiotics to treat disease in us. If we have microbes, bacteria that are becoming resistant to these antibiotics over time because they're continuously exposed to them in the environment, that's going to be a problem for us. And so we should be concerned about antibiotic resistance in, uh, in the environment where they're exposed to antibiotics. Where are we going? I'm done here now. Um, rather than having to look at individual organisms and how they respond to particular chemicals, like carbamazepine, like a hormone, we're, be we're becoming able now with the molecular biological advances that are being made to see how these chemicals can affect genes in many organisms all at the same time. And so what we can do is generate these, well, rather complicated dendrograms to see, well, what one chemical might have an effect on several hundred genes in a particular organism. So what we're, where we're going is saying, well, if we have 
these chemicals in our water, we might be able to see how many genes are affected by those chemicals in the environment. That's where we're going to go next in our studies. All right. And I'm going to end there because I am slightly over time. What can we do? Well, I was asked to present to you a few things that we can do that really make a difference. Number one, what goes down our drain matters. It really matters. Uh, whether it's pharmaceuticals or whether it's hazardous wastes, we should be thinking about what we put down our drain. Proper disposal of pharmaceuticals has waste. There are many county and citywide take back programs or disposal sites where you can take unused antibiotics and pharmaceuticals. We need to expand that. If you have hazardous waste sitting in your garage, don't pour it down the drain. Don't pour it on the ground. Bring it to the, the has waste facility. And finally, um, we should be thinking more about eliminating this contamination to impervious surfaces like driveways. When we wash the car, what we put on our lawn near the lake really makes a big difference. It doesn't just go away. It ends up somewhere, and usually that's surface water or groundwater. So I'm going to stop there. I apologize for being a couple of minutes over. Um, and I don't know if we have time for questions, but I will be around all day, too. Yes? I'd just like to state that uh, uh, you, could, you could also say, uh, say what we put in our bodies instead of what we put down our drinks. The comment was we could expand that to say you know, what we put in us makes a difference as well as what we put down our drinks. It's a really good comment. I am starting to talk to pharmacists at the University of Minnesota who are thinking along those very same lines. What they want to do is mimic what is being done in Stockholm, where they're developing green pharmaceuticals, green pharmacologists, to not only rank chemicals and pharmaceuticals and medications based on their effectiveness and how they treat disease or conditions, but also how hard they might be in the environment. And so it's going to be another dimension on what kind of chemicals might be more commonly prescribed. If we know that diclofenac might have very toxic properties on wildlife, for example, that can correspond with prescribing uh, advice that doctors use. And it's becoming more widely accepted. Thanks very much.